My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. We are here at the KSC just blasting through time to get to our next launch. And we'll get to the launch in just a little bit, but I'm really going to have to power through this launch and the next one pretty quickly. They're nothing that you haven't seen it's like before, but what I really want to get to in this episode is my Otter X-1 single stage to orbit space plane. That's what I really want to make this episode about, but in the interest of continuity and in the interest of showing you well, all of the missions in which I perform in my particular campaign, I do want to show you this. This is the Kermes 2 propulsion module. You might recall that the Kermes 2 is my EVE Explorer, and in previous episodes we had put up the command module, the habitation module, and her crew are already aboard and ready to go. They're just waiting this last module to make the vessel complete. So we will complete the vessel, and then we'll be sending them on their way, or at least uh, partially on their way. I'll explain to it when I get to it, because again, you've seen me do interplanetary transfers a number of times before, but each time I'm slowly figuring more things out, and I do figure out a few more things that I'll be talking about in a little bit. Also coming up uh, in this episode, besides the space plane, which again, I really do want to focus on, will be the launch of the Kegel 7. The Kegel 7 is also part of the EVE mission. It's going to be a Gilly lander. And I'll let you know right now, uh, it doesn't go without incident. It's not a disastrous thing, but one of these uh, little annoyances, little things that I uh, overlook in the planning process that I have to kind of work around again. Uh, but you know what? I'll leave it at that, and we'll get to that in more detail. Uh, when we get to it in just a little bit. Right now, let's talk a little bit about some of the new features that are on the Kermes 2 that are different from the Kermes 1 that is currently on, to, on its way to Drez. Now, one of them is this Gigantor solar panel. As we're going closer to the sun, generating electricity from the sun's rays is not going to be an issue, so that's for powering our science module. And secondly, with communication, I didn't need as big an antenna as I had before, so I got a, the smaller Communitron 8888, and as you can see, I put it on this remote tech piston, so that once extended, it stares right down the central axis, which will be the rotation axis of this thing once we get gravity going. Oh, I think that looks a little bit better than what was on the Kermes 1. Anyway, other than that, this is exactly the same as the Kermes one. So I'm gonna skip over the rest of the details except for making a very small confession. Well, maybe not that small of a confession. I realized a little while after launching the first module to this, long after I could do anything about it, um, this thing had to go into an inclined orbit of about 12 degrees. Um, and that's to help with the normal component of the ejection burn to get myself out to Eve. And again, that angle is being provided by the Window Transfer Planner mod. And in the construction of this parking orbit that I have here, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm 12 degrees the wrong way. <laughs> I got my ascending node and my descending node backwards. So when I'm ejecting, I should be ejecting towards the south. And instead, because I put uh, where my ejection angle is going to be, where my burn is going to be, I'm actually going towards the north. So I actually made it worse. Uh, this ended up translating into um, a little bit more normal than I would normally have liked. Nevertheless, uh, I did end up with an ejection bird that got me to Eve in around the same time frame as what the window transfer planner was saying I should get it in at, a, uh, at 1,399 meters per second, which is still just below the budget that I had planned. So it's, it's no big disaster. And what I'm doing here is I'm planning, I'm making sure that I'm going to get my capture, that my capture is going to cost what I'm expecting it to cost. And here I'm getting a capture for about 500 meters per second. I budgeted 1,400 meters per second. And I know it's still very eccentric, but once I get a capture, I can do as many sort of light arrow breakings as I want around Eve. Eve does have an atmosphere, so 
that should work to bring that eccentricity down. So I'm going to be saving a lot of fuel at the other end. So that's great. So uh, let's get into sort of the what's the thing I figured out. And that is in setting up these kind of pre-orbit burns. With the low thrust to weight ratio of this vessel, this ejection burnout to EVE was going to take about 15 minutes. And I had the same situation when I was making my ejections out towards Drez. And you might recall that what I did is I split the burn into two. The first burn being about half the amount of delta V would put me into an eccentric orbit so that I, the vessel would do that particular orbit, come back to periapsis at the right moment to complete the rest of the ejection burn to send it out towards Drez. And in order to do that, I had to do a fair bit of calculating kind of ahead of time, figure out what kind of period would be appropriate for that orbit, and then what should the apoapsis of that orbit be to give me the period that I want. But just, you know, doing this, I kind of realized that although that worked, it was way more work than I needed to do. Here, all I did was put in a maneuver node uh, ahead of the maneuver node that the, the, the ejection burn maneuver node used precise node to move it forward until the two nodes were right on top of each other though the first one's coming up in only several minutes like just when I come around to it in the orbit as opposed to the other one which is still days and days away. And then I figured well you know about 250 meters per second ejects you from Kerbin's sphere of influence, so I didn't want to do that. I figured 850 meters per second was safe, so I put in 850 meters per second of prograde, looked at my ejection burn, looked at the amount of normal, and then put in the amount of normal proportional to what my ejection burn normal to prograde was, because I did want the two burns to be proportionally correct towards one another. Then I looked at how long that burn was going to take by simply looking at the uh, amount of time it was going to take to get to apoapsis and more or less doubling it, pushing, you know, using the advance orbit button with precise node to push that maneuver forward in time so it was like approximately that number of days ahead of the ejection burn. And then I simply tweaked the amount of burn until I got to the point where the ejection burn maneuver node ended up back at periapsis. I didn't have to get into calculating what the period which should be. When the two maneuver nodes are on top of each other, I know I have the period right. So I ended up with this 898 meter per second burn without doing any calculating at all. However, it would still take about 10 minutes to do, so I thought, to do the burn. So I thought, well, that worked so well. It was not that hard to do. Let's do that two more times. So I took that burn, split it up two more times using this exact same process. So I have a total of four burns all timed one into the other that eventually gets me out into my EVE intercept. And so here we are about a day later getting ready for burn number one. And you can see here that this whole burn is only going to take about three minutes, three and a half minutes. You can also see from... Uh, the plume, the engine plume coming out of here that I do have again the stock LDN Nerva engines uh, rather than the Kerbal Interstellar um, solid core nuclear rockets, that's what they're called. Uh, and the reason for that is because they are slightly slightly higher thrust, slightly more efficient, but don't generate any electricity passively. I needed that electrical generation for my DREZ mission because to put on the correct, you know, the number of solar power panels that I would need out of DREZ to power a science module would be a little bit too much. So uh, there I wanted the nuclear reactors to power the vessel. But now that we're going towards EVE, single Gigantor, no problem whatsoever. And that will power this absolutely fine so we ended up finishing off this burn the next one's not going to be for about another day and a half so we'll let these folks ride around for a while while we get to our next launch this is the kegel 7 our ghillie lander which is going to be part of our eve mission thanks to the low gravity of ghillie i was able to build this thing big it's equipped with all the science and the science module it'll be able to take the entire crew of the Karayan 2 down to the surface of Gilly and do some hops into some other biomes. And while we enjoy this sunset, as I time warp to my launch time of 1.45, and I'm going to make sure this time that I do launch into the correct inclination, so, you know, absolutely nothing's going to go wrong this time.
And that's our orbit. So all we have to do now is detach the booster. I wanna, I don't think I need, no, I'm not gonna take that fuel. Nah, won't bother with that. Let's, let's, let's just stage here. We'll deorbit that booster later. Okay, and then all I gotta do, I just wanna adjust the attitude of the Kermes a little bit and start setting up my orbit. Wait, I can't move. And okay, the antenna is definitely extended. That's cool. I know I have electricity. Did I not put a probe core on this thing? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I don't think I put a probe core on here. Oh my gosh, what a dummy. <laughs> oh no. I must have tested it with Kerbals in it. And never noticed that I didn't have a probe core. And actually, while I'm looking at it here, I don't think I have a dish antenna either. I think I only have the Communitron. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna need a, uh, okay, I need a dish antenna, I need a probe core. Thankfully, I do know a place not too far away where I have those. Here we are with Bill at Kerbin Station, and uh, yeah, I am a bit of a pack rat, and it might just pay off. Yep, that is a probe core, so we'll scoop that up. How about over on this side, what do we got? Yes, that is it. That's a Communitron 8888. That will do. So we'll get Bill back inside. And then we need a vessel to get us over there. Now, it's only about a 20 kilometer diff distance difference in altitude of the orbits, but it is a 12 degree difference in inclination. Uh, and the Dream Chaser, which has been my normal LKO uh, transfer vehicle that you've been seeing me use, uh, has nowhere near enough to be able to make a 12 degree inclination change uh, near orbit around Kerbin. But I happen to have, well, this relic from the past. Yes, this is the Kuryuz. I haven't seen me use this for a while, but fully fueled, the Kuryuz is 811 meters per second of delta V and quite a lot of monoprop on top of that. And I'm not even counting that. That should be enough. Not only that, it also has weeks and weeks of life support and quite a bit of room it can fit five kerbals and so what we have here we have bill and we have jeb that's the that's our that's going to be our crew for the mission because they are the only pilot and the only engineer i have on the station and they're leaving behind three scientists uh, so i hope they'll be okay they should be able to manage things just fine and what we need to do is we need to of course make our inclination change and change our altitude do a rendezvous which you've seen me do lots and lots of times before so i'll just cut to the chase here and show me show you yay here we are we're there okay we'll zero their velocity just a little bit more oh that'll do let's get bill out there get the job done now the Kuryu's here does not have the fuel to reverse what it just did and get back to Kerbin Station, but that's one of the great things about it. It can descend without any issue. So I kind of had that, I was kind of guessing that was going to happen. So Bill and Jeb are not going to be able to return back to Kerbin Station. They're going to have to descend back down to the service, but don't feel so bad for them. They're actually on Kerbin Station patiently waiting for the uh Korion 2 to get refueled so they can go off on a mission that I had planned for them. A mission that by the way would get Jeb, I believe, to level three. Um but don't feel too bad for them because well Jeb kind of figuring, you know what, uh mission control, they probably still really do want me to get to level three. And uh, you know I am kind of short on Kerbals and expertise and especially engineers, so Bill's sitting there going, you know what, they might need to get me right back into space. So, and I think the way back might be just a little bit more fun than uh, what we're doing here. But anyway, Bill uh, get on, gets on to the probe core. He also gets on the antenna. I'm just attaching them here to the docking port. I know that obscures the docking port, but um, you know what? By the time it's close to um the dude dude the the uh I'm getting all my Kerbal vehicles mixed up the Kermes 2 once we're in orbit around Eve and we're we're getting ready to dock I can fly a Kerbal and they can take this crap off and then the two vessels can dock without any issue 
So with that mission accomplished, why don't we just cut down to Jeb and Bill descending through the surface here. Yeah, you know, and the, the versatility of the Kuryus, you know, I was ready to mothball this vehicle, but this mission, I really don't have another vehicle like this. Like I was mentioning, the Dream Chaser um, really doesn't live up to the what, what the Kuryus can do as far as getting work done within in low carbon orbit. Uh, and neither will the Otter X1, which you will be seeing very, very shortly. I think uh, I might need to put myself up another one of these Kerr uses and keep it handy. It is a pretty nice vessel to have. With it now less than two hours to the completion of the X1, I thought I'd show you what vessels I have here in orbit. Uh, while we time warp, here is the Kermes 2. It has actually performed a second of those uh, pre-burns. I didn't show it to you, just wanted to move things along. It was exactly the same as the first one. And speaking of not showing you burns, out here we have the Kegel 7, which has also performed two burns. You can see it's in this much higher orbit. It actually, the next time it's at Periapsis, will be performing its uh, escape burn, um, and I didn't show you those as well. And way over here, we have the good old Korion 1. Uh, it has performed one arrow breaking pass, and it is coming back to perform a second one. But oh, here we go. So, as the sun rises on a new day at the KSC, it's time for us to welcome our new vehicle. And as the Otter X-1 gets powered down the runway by its twin whiplash JX-4 engines. I want you to take a look at the crew and do notice that Jeb's Gambit did pay off. Yeah, we do need Jebediah and Bill back in space. So once they are down on the surface and had a little bit of a rest, it was time for them to get back up there. And I still need them for that mission. And along for the ride as well is Valentina. So Valentina and Jebediah get to be our first pilots of this new vehicle. And uh, flying this thing and getting it up, it's it's a bit tricky um, because the whiplashes work better as your airspeed increases, but you can't build up high airspeed until the atmosphere is thinner. I like to think of the ascent in four stages. One is to get the thinner air as quickly as you can. Phase two is to build speed using just the jet engines. Phase three is to get your apoapsis up to 80 kilometers using the rocket engines. And then finally stage four is to circularize. So right now I'm paying a lot of attention to my vertical speed, trying to keep my climb rate reasonable without sacrificing air speed too much because I need thinner air. I'm also watching the effective air speed on the air intakes. I'm no expert on aeronautics, but I seem to get best results if my actual speed is fairly close to this effective air speed. If my speed drops too much, I pitch down, but I still want to keep climbing at a reasonable rate. As I get close to about 8 kilometers altitude or so, I figure the air is thin enough, so I pitch down. And now it's about building speed, while still maintaining a gentle climb rate. Here I'm really watching my thrust. I want this to continually build. You can also monitor, monitor the thrust on the stock windows. Still watching effective airspeed too, and I'm making sure my actual airspeed remains close to it. I still love Kerbal Engineer, but uh, those pinnable menus on the side certainly are useful. As we get close to 12 kilometers, those whiplashes are really starting to do their thing. And I'm hovering just under 600 kilonewtons of thrust. So although my thrust is now leveling off, I am still accelerating. I'm still picking up speed. You want to get the most that you can out of these higher efficiency jet engines before going to the less efficient rockets. Soon though, the air begins to get too thin and my thrust starts falling off. That's okay, that's what's going to happen. But I still want more speed, more speed. My speed is still building, so I still stick with those jet engines. I want to get well over 1,100 meters per second before I start kicking in those rockets. But I mean, I'm getting close. 
closing in on 1,070 meters per second. Still want more speed. Oh, come on, keep going. I can see my, my rate of acceleration is definitely going down. My speed is not increasing very quickly now. And as that speed, yeah. Yeah, I think I, my speed is beginning to level off. I think I've squeezed out what I can here. It's time for those arrow spikes. Yeah. I love that sound, and they look so good with real plume. And I'm just going to pitch up just a little bit. I don't want to stray too far from my prograde vector. To be honest, my pitch is not actually that much lower than what I would be if I was doing a regular rocket ascent. So I'm treating this like a rocket ascent. And we'll turn off those whiplashes. They're not producing very much thrust anymore. We'll close the air intakes. Improve our aerodynamics just a little bit. Yeah, from here on in, this is very much like a normal uh, ascent with a rocket. Uh, just pitching up a little bit more than the prograde vector, not wanting to stray too far. And I'm just waiting for my apoapsis to get up to 80 kilometers, at which point I'm going to do main engine cut off. You really see at this point, too, how quickly my fuel and oxidizer are going down. I used a little bit more fuel than uh, I did when I did testing. I spent a little bit too much time, I think, getting up here. I think I'll, I'll, think I'll ascend a little bit steeper during that phase one, but we are getting close. Just waiting for our apoapsis to get to 80 kilometers. There we go, 75. And boom, 80 kilometers. So we're gonna lock that onto the prograde vector. We're gonna close up all of these windows here. We don't need those anymore. And then it's just getting up to 80 kilometers and circularizing. Now all told, this ascent took about 14 minutes, which to be honest is about three times what it takes for my regular rocket ascent. Uh, in addition, I'm flying the whole time. Uh, you know, with my rocket ascents, it's all automated until I get to the circularization part. So I just push a button and off it goes. So it definitely is more work to get up a space plane like this, but you know, cool factor. <laughs> I think the cool factor wins out. And it should be cheaper too. I mean, we reuse this entire vehicle. The plan, of course, is to get it back down onto the run rate for 100% recovery costs. The only thing I spent money on is fuel. And there we are. We are now in our 80 by 80 orbit. Still have 200 meters per second left. Plenty to uh, get ourselves to Kerbin Station. You're probably noticing as well, I have quite a bit more oxidizer. Then I have liquid fuel. Oh, I don't know. I might donate it to the station, but then again, the station's always overloaded with oxidizer. Maybe I'll just uh, find a way to dump it. <laughs> I actually do have a KAS uh, fuel valve that you can use to dump fuel that I've had for a long, long time and never really used. I do, this is the first vehicle I put it on for some reason. I never used it before, so maybe that would be a good experiment see if I can uh, get rid of some of this XX oxidizer. Okay, so right now, though, I just want to bring this thing to a relative stop with the station. Well, I'm still reasonably far away. There we go. That'll do it. Let's get Jeb out now. I'm going to fly him over. See, the problem is that um, I have a plan to extend the docking node on the station. In fact, that's my first planned mission for my Mark III space shuttle, which hasn't been built yet, but it's in, <laughs> it is on my list of things to do. But unfortunately, it doesn't really help me right now. So what Jeb is going to do is he's going to uh, take one of these dream chasers off one of the longer of the two docking berths. You can see here it's on a, the, the the it's a bit more extended that docking port than the one beside it. So we're going to move this dream chaser over to the shorter docking berth. Woo! <laughs> and oh oh, Jeb seemed to have induced himself a little bit of rotation in here. Oh, it's going back and forth. Okay, I think that's remote tech doing that. Well, we'll undock, and we'll deal with that later. Here we go. We're going back this way. 
and we'll turn on the torque and we will rotate it so that we have our docking ports aligned that's the other way and it, oh crap oh nuts i just took out one of those solar arrays ah get out of here back off back off back off i thought i had the remote tech wobble going and i thought it was going to rotate back but no it's clearly just flat out spinning now shoot Oh, okay, well, that's something else I'm going to need to bring up here. <laughs> well done. Well, obviously, I'm going to have to bring this under some control. Let's just take remote tech and put it on the normal vector. That should likely help. I'll also add, not that I can really use this as an excuse, but I am going to try and use this as an excuse, is actually, right at this point, my frame rate is really coming down to a crawl. I have too many parts it's always about part count too many parts in this situation with the station and the two dream chasers and you can see the Korean two down there and then the x1 back there still also obviously still being rendered too um and the frame rate just came right down and i'm speeding it up right now so that it's actually playing at a normal rate but um or else this would just take too long but I'm going to use that as my excuse as why I didn't notice it was rotating as badly as it was. Anyway, Jebediah got the Dream Chaser back onto that one port. And then it was time for Valentina to fly in the X1. Got to make sure that the rudder clears here. And Oh, wait, wait. I got uh, some reaction wheels buried in here. I had buried these reaction wheels. Oh, good. Got them. <laughs> There we go. I have reaction wheels buried in the middle of that that you can't see, obviously, now. Thanks to pinnable menus, I'm able to pin that menu off to the side, and so when I'm ready, I can turn the reaction wheels off. When we get close to docking. Why don't we cut ourselves so that we are closer to that docking? You can see here that I am... You, the rudder is so close to... No, no, bail, bail. Back off, back off, back off. I got a better idea. There's no reason I need to come in here perpendicular like this. Let's rotate about another 45 degrees this way. And the rudder should fit into that space, I would think, between the Dream Chaser and that fuel module. Okay, let's spin this around here and get a better view. Yeah, I think that's going to work. Rotate a little more. Okay, everything seems... Oh, i got to slide a little bit sideways. Get over there. Oh, come on, it's pretty close. It should be sucking it in at any moment. And, oh, 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 there, that's it. We are docked. It isn't pretty. <laughs> I gotta work on this docking system. It looks really bad. And I've used up every single one of my docking ports, so we'll have to deal with that later when the Korean 1 shows up. But uh, for now, I'm going to have to draw this episode to a close. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.